in my days, I won't, I won't even say as a would-be poet, but I'll say as an unpublished poet, right? That, you know, um, mm -hmm. there is some of the same process that goes on. You're looking at something and poetry also makes things in some ways very abstract, you really pare it down. episode of the mixtape with Scott, I had the great pleasure to talk with Rajiv Dehajia, a professor and economist at New York University. This was my first time to talk to Rajiv, but I feel like I've known him for a long time because of how many times I've read, studied, and taught two of his papers, co-authored with an old classmate, Waba, which used propensity scores to revisit an old famous article written in 1986 by Bob Lone. Bob's paper and Rajiv's papers too, sort of play in my mind these central roles in the evolution of the credibility revolution, running from Princeton's industrial relations section, from Orly Ashenfelter and David Card, both who advised Bob alone, through Josh Angrist, his classmate who graduated, went to Harvard, met Hito Wimbens and Don Rubin uh, and worked on their 1990s work on instrumental variables. Rajiv, though, was a student in the economics department at Harvard in the early to mid 1990s, which was also when Embens and Angers were there. And one year, Embens organized a new class on causal inference that he co taught with Don Rubin from the stats department. And Rajiv took it along with Wava. This interview helps add just a few more colorful details to that broader story. But that's just a skeleton that sort of helps give justification for why I reach out to certain people. This is primarily an interview with a real person, a real interesting economist, Rajiv Dehajia, who shares with me his own story, his own passions, his loves about economics and empiricism and what drew him into economics and why he stays. He is uh, someone who finds life beautiful and finds in economics beauty. And I hope you find this interview uh, to be as much fun and as fascinating to listen to as I did. Thanks for turning into my mixtape. I'm Scott Cunningham, the host. Okay, well, this is a genuine, uh, it's always an honor to talk to anybody uh, on the podcast. It, it is a, a particularly unique feeling to get to speak, to get to interview today, my guest, uh, Rahib Dahajia, but I don't know if I said that correctly. So I'm almost positive I didn't. That's pretty good though. It's, it's Rajiv, Rajiv Dahajia. Rajiv, can you, for the sake of the reader, the listener, um, tell us again your name and what you do for a living? Of course. My name is Rajiv Dehija. I'm a professor of economics and public policy at New York University. Um, and in my own work, I am, I call myself a, a poor man's econometrician sometimes, but that really means I'm interested in applied um, microeconomic topics, but with an interest in methodological questions. And so um, I like to solve practical problems. I like to actually look at very applied questions, but from time to time, I like to pivot back and forth and take a step up and think, what's what's the underlying methodological question here? Is there something that we can say that would be helpful uh, to a broad set of, of applied of applied readers and researchers? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm teaching this history of economic thought class right now, and uh, I'm uh, learning about Adam Smith. I didn't know anything about him before, except for like, you know, stuff you could put on a bumper sticker. And the, the, the things that I did not know was um, all of what he did, all of his economics really seemed to come at the service of, he was interested in public policy. Were you always like that? Were you always somebody that was kind of interested in like, does your interest in methodology come from an overall interest in something bigger than that? That's that's a great question. And um, since we're going to speak candidly, I'll, my, the candid answer is actually no. Going back to the beginning, not really. I think what drew me into the world that I'm in now originally was some sort of intellectual pleasure. I just mm. found some things really interesting. And I found the pursuit of ideas intoxicating and interesting, yeah. exciting. I thought, wow, this would be an amazing way to, to spend one's life. Right. Early on, I was probably uncertain or even agnostic to some extent. Well, you know, what could that be? There was some, you're in college, you're studying many things. It could be just about anything at that point, right? And so 
as I progressed and I started, I've lashed onto economics, I was a graduate student, then I was an assistant professor, I do sort of recall a specific moment in my mind when I was an assistant professor, which sort of made me pivot a little bit um, toward the toward an interest in, in public policy or sort of applied problems that can actually, uh, however indirectly, be of, of, of benefit to society. And so, yeah, I was an assistant professor uh, on tenure track at Columbia. Uh, as you know, tenure track anywhere is a particularly stressful activity, but particularly at some universities, especially Columbia in those days, you know, there was sort of a sense that it's it's not really going to happen. And so you need to be, you need to be set to hit the market at the end of your tenure track and really present yourself well. Um, mm. You can get the job that will, that, that will, that will offer you tenure. Mm. Um, and so if, if that's, if that's your goal, of course, you should be, uh, as you would advise your students or as, or as I advise mine, right? There's strategies you should follow to do that. Mm. But in the middle of this, when I was sort of trying to be sort of, you know, to take care of my career, um, someone came to me with a project that involved um, something in the real world that seemed to be immensely important. It was a large project funded by many people, um, sort of dealing with a public health issue. And I thought, wow, that would be such an interesting thing to work on. Because if I work on that, you know, and it's even slightly useful, there's just even a slightly useful piece of information or knowledge that comes out of that, what a potential benefit it could be. Mm-hmm. At the same time, the, the practical part in me as an assistant professor trying to get tenure said, but this this project could be a could be a bottomless pit of effort that leads to, you know, to, to no publications that help me in in my in my in my academic career. Right. And so I ultimately, you know, this story does not, you know, I don't the short the story shows me perhaps in my in, in my practical sense, I actually declined to participate in that. But this stayed in my mind saying, look, you know, if we're doing these things, it's important to pursue in ideas that we find interesting to pursue um, intellectual curiosity. But I think it's also important to do things that have the hope, at least, of helping people. And I say that with all the modesty uh, of an academic, uh, and that too of, of you know, an academic who, who does things that are sometimes abstract, right? Yeah. And, and, and that led me to not only have this sort of methodological strand of my work, but also add on applied strands of my work. Saying, okay, mm. you know, let me directly tackle to the best of my ability problems that I find interesting and that I think are important. So yeah. uh, sometime around then I began doing a set of papers on, on child labor that sort of took me in some percent, I don't know whether it's 50% by now or you know, in some significant proportion toward being a development economist. I thought, you know, mm. this is an area where some of the tools that I've been using, some of the skills I have, some of the questions that interest me crop up but they crop up in a way that has this huge potential impact uh, on the well-being of, of of a large number of people. Yeah, yeah. But I can see on your wall, the re- re- listeners can't see this, but you have all this beautiful artwork on your wall. And you said that you were originally someone who was kind of like just sort of drawn to things that were just intellectually interesting. It, it, is it sort of part of your background that you were, you sort of have a... Um, is that connected? This like, you know, because I, I think about the art, I think about a love of beauty. Lots of times art appreciation is kind of almost hedonistic. You just you just sure. love how it, you love how it feels to look at something. And, you know, uh, economics itself has that has always had that feel for me, too, you know, of just being mm-hmm. intrinsically beautiful. Are you that kind of person, though? That's an excellent question. And it's very perceptive because I think the answer is is yes. You know, and and um to, to sort of validate the cliche in some ways, um, you know, in terms of children fulfilling the the um, the dreams of their parents. My my father is is, an, is, is a medical doctor, so is my mother. Uh, but my father always um, had a great ambition to be um, um, to, to make an intellectual contribution to his areas of interest, which are which are nothing near economics. Mm. Um, but I think from him, um, I did pick up uh, that that love of beauty. In fact, it turns out that his his area of study is sort of the philosophy of art, um, and so aesthetic theory, right? And so very directly relating to to the question of of, of beauty and what is beauty, yeah. um, but also just the pleasure of 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 ideas, mm. and, and with it one additional pleasure, which unfortunately does not always come out in in our own world of academic writing, um, is the pleasure of words, yeah, right? which is you know how you actually express that idea. 
Right. And I'll be honest to say, and I, I, I know, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure you've experienced this as well, that you know, as we become better academic writers, we're writing papers for journals, we're writing with co-authors, it does sort of smooth out or sand down the idiosyncrasies of our style a little bit. But yeah. you know, when you read a well-written paper, and there are well-written papers out there, you just say, oh yeah, that's, that's lovely, because you're saying something, yeah. you're saying it clearly, but you're saying it in a way that's actually interesting and engaging. So yes, all of these have been sort of part of what motivated me um at at the very at the very beginning mm. and of course that could have led in in many directions I, i'm delighted it, it led in the way that it did um but yeah there were sort of many branching off points yeah e- even within economics when i was a uh, graduate student first second year graduate student i actually was uncertain whether i would pursue a dissertation in micro theory or in, in econometrics right so i Actually, those were my two fields when I was at Harvard. You sort of had to declare two fields. And my two fields were micro theory. Um, so Andrea Mascole was my sort of putative advisor if I, if I had gone in that direction. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the other was um, sort of econometrics. That was that was Gary Chamberlain and Hito Embens, right? And so um, I was sort of, for a while, I was, I was pursuing them both because I found them both incredibly interesting. But mm. I, I also did love some of the pure intellectual and abstract pleasure of um of, of the micro theory side of it. As, as it yeah. turns out, I, I was not a good, I was not a good micro theorist. I'm glad I discovered that um early in life. Mm-hmm. Um and I'm also glad I, I you know I count my great fortune being um at a place where you know we were sort of allowed to explore our intellectual interests. So you know Harvard as a doctoral program um was sort of the place where you you were sort of left to pursue what you thought was interesting. Yeah. And so I was briefly in this schizophrenic situation of pursuing two very different things. Yeah. Um, but you know, I did it long enough to discover, yes, I do love them both, but I I I I am better at one than the other, right? And right. and I'm glad I got a chance to do that. Yeah. You know, otherwise I might have just been a um a, a not very good micro theorist um yeah. sitting somewhere in the world. And instead yeah. I got I had the good fortune of of getting to do to do what I've done. And so mm. Yeah, um, it it um, I think that's a very perceptive observation. What were you like as a kid? What 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 on that topic about you know what what I have noticed as a kid that you were drawn to to life of the mind or beauty or things like that. This is a, a an interesting question. I don't have I don't have a very clear answer. We'll give you two contradictory answers, um, and and one of them is or maybe both of them in some ways are inspired by by observing my own son, which I think is the closest I can get to imagining what I would have been like when I was five or or eight or nine beyond my own recollections, which are of course you know one sided and faulty. Um, I, I do remember that when I was um, fairly young, five, six, seven, somewhere around that age. Um, uh, there was one of the, the nurses at my pediatrician's office or something. You used to call me the professor. Um, and I, I, I remember that. I don't know why she called me that. Um, but there must've been some reason, right? So that kind of pushes in the direction of saying, well, yes, maybe I was always a little bit like this. Mm -hmm. Um, at the same time, I, I sort of remember myself, um, at least in those early years as being fundamentally a happy-go-lucky person, um, not necessarily, um, setting myself up, at least at that time, which is perhaps not unreasonable if you're seven or eight, or sort of diving deeply into things. And so, um, you know, may- maybe I had a bit of bit of both in me at that time. Mm, mm. So you went, so you grew up, did you grow up in Canada? That is right, in Ottawa, Canada. Uh, okay, okay. And so, uh, so Carlton, you end up, what was, so what was your, in high school, before we get to Carlton, in high school, you know, um, what did you think you could imagine or did you sort of hope your future would be like the kinds of things you did were you thinking maybe i might be a doctor or were you did you have other aspirations that's that's um a good question and i i would say that pretty much fairly early on in high school i think um i zeroed in on the notion of pursuing graduate school um and not not being um not becoming a medical doctor to my mm. disappointment. Um, I think part of it, you know, since we are talking about sort of background, like, you know, and early life, which is it's always fun to, to find somebody who's willing to indulge you in these conversations. Um, I think it's sort of important to note uh, in this that my brother is also an economist. Oh, uh, he also did a PhD in economics, right? And so, you know, the empiricist in us will have to ask, you know, 
could this be a correlated event? Oh, right? I'm going to Google it. Wait, who's your brother? Uh, his name is Vivek Lahija. He's actually now, um, he did his PhD at Columbia, and now he is a professor um, at Carleton University, where we both went to college. Oh, no way. Um, and so, you know, I think- um, Is he a younger in, brother or an older he's brother? He's an older brother, exactly. He's older, he's okay. Older. Right, and so in some ways, I would sort of say that the the set of forces that led us down this path were, were sort of highly correlated, right? That, you mm. know, in some ways, I and mean, in a very direct way, actually, right? I learned because he was a couple of years ahead of me. We also had a very good um, high school economics um, teacher, mm. right? Um, uh, uh, a charismatic and 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 somewhat mysterious man, right? It's sometimes hard to know what he was saying, but he was passionate. Uh, mm. He was knowledgeable, um, and he really kind of gripped you. And so, having had the benefit of somebody um, whose interests ultimately, you know, we're, 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 you know, our interests are similar, we sort of working our way through. You 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 learn from those around you, right? Um, yeah. And so I sort of had this uh, pathway of learning about economics, and so. Um, you know, I think that the fact that we were both going through this, me with a trivial lag, like is is one of the important explanations for how I ended up uh, down this down this mm, path. Mm, mm. So you go to Carlton, and uh, are you thinking at Carlton immediately? So, I mean, it sounds like economics was with is kind of like in your head way before college, but is that true? That is true. By the time oh, I arrived, okay. by the time I arrived at Carlton University. Um, I already knew I wanted to do economics. That is not so unusual in the Canadian system, which really requires you to take, similar to the British system, it requires you to take at least half, if not more, of your courses within your major. So it's actually really hard if you, you really sort of have to decide in your first year or you have to give yourself a couple of options in your first year and then really narrow down in your second year. Mm. Um, but I, I already knew by the time I, I had joined um, that that was a path that I was going to pursue. What did you find so interesting about economics as a young person? That that early kind of spark that you thought this is the, given somebody that loves beautiful thoughts. You know, what was it about economics? So, so economics offered um, a, an intellectually elegant way to explain human behavior and phenomena that we observe in the world that that to that to someone else might seem sort of messy, right? And of course, messiness can also be interesting. But it's mm. a question of how do you approach that? And the fact mm. that economics was trying to um, organize, um, sort of to, to try to explain this behavior in an organized way through a systematic set of models and assumptions was very appealing, right? It sort of yeah. tried to take the seeming chaos and say, well, yes, you know, there, there is, as we know in our world, there is randomness out there. There's an epsilon, but underneath all these epsilons, mm. there actually, there, there is or there could be um, a structure um, that could explain a lot of what we see, or at least a, a big chunk of it. And let's try yeah. to push that thinking further. Mm -hmm. um, is that is that model the right one or not? Mm -hmm. um, and I think, a, a, as is true for many people who study economics, particularly of, of a certain generation, when when we started studying economics, there was, of course, a much greater emphasis early on. It was front loaded with sort of the conceptual frameworks, right? I mean, I don't want to say theory because as an undergrad, you're not really doing heavy duty math, but you know, it was very sort of theoretically motivated. And it's only later, I would say, really ultimately in graduate school where I got to sort of taste the second half of it. And I, I think that, you know, there are many new approaches to teaching economics, new principal book, principles books out there these days. And what I appreciate about some of these new approaches is that it puts the evidence, the empirical part, yeah. sort of up front, right at the front, saying, look, you know, yes, we have all these frameworks. It is part of what makes us economists. We don't want to ignore them. We don't want to downplay them. Right? Yeah. We're not just data scientists or statisticians. Mm -hmm. Those are great fields to be, but we're not. We happen to be economists. And so here's a way that we look at the world. Right. But right away, we have to say, look, yes, this is there are these theories and assumptions. But you know, a lot of people like me spend many years of, of undergrad saying, yeah, but these assumptions don't seem right, do they? Right? We know that's true, not true. Yeah. Right. And of course, we know that. And you have all these empiricists out there sort of trying to match the theory we have with the data and trying to push both of them forward. And so I, I think that I, not atypical for many undergraduate um, um, college majors from, from 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 the late 20th century, if I can call it that, right? That's yeah. that's how we were taught. I guess I was I was lucky, um, sort of in graduate school, to um, be able to discover the other side of it, right? If I just right. if I had sort of stayed with that initial motivation and excitement that of the beginning, I would have gone down that micro theory path, which I yeah. did find incredibly appealing. Yeah. But I got I had the good fortune of sort of discovering the other side of it, which eventually came to 
to be. It was more the pure theory. It was like, you know, like pure micro theory. It wasn't like, like Gary Becker, uh, like no, it, it, models it, it, of behavior. It was like pure. It, it was, theory. yes, it, it was pure theory. Unrealized, an unrealized uh, aspiration, you know? So maybe mm. it, if, if what I said of, of my father with respect to me is true, then maybe my son will grow up to be a micro theorist. Who knows? Yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> um, or maybe he'll be a mathematician or something yeah. even, even more abstract. Who knows? Yeah. Well, so did you, when you graduated from Carleton, when, when did you say to yourself, you know, I, I think I want, when, when did you actually start saying to yourself, not, I just want to study economics. I want to be an economist. Is that, is that something that happened in your life? Like that kind of like revelate, re, you know, resolution almost. It happened, but it happened in, in a way that was, that was so, um, implicit and complete that I couldn't even point to a revelation, right? That mm. by the time, you know, since my brother and I are both economists, we're kind of moving and moving along in parallel, right? And by the time right. I joined, he was already in his third year. Um, he, he hadn't applied for graduate schools or anything like that, right? But, you know, he was sort of thinking about it. And by the time I, 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 I came in, I thought, yeah, you know, this seems like a really good path for me as well. I'm interested um, in these questions as well. My mm. own um, skills um, seem well suited to it. Um, and so, you know, if it's interesting and, and you think you can, you think you can do it, um, and, and then, then, then why not? Right. But it's true that, yeah, there wasn't a moment where let's say like, you know, midway through college, I said, oh yeah, I should really apply for a PhD. I think I, I, I was pretty clear, um, from early on. It just, I, it just assumed it and, and it, and it just happened that way. Mm. Well, you say the skills, what, what, what were you noticing about yourself? Like, as you were kind of interacting with that, with this degree, so, you know, without, without overstate it, uh, you know, I, I was certainly good at math, right? So um, I loved math um, and, um, you know, I loved, which also overlaps with economics, that ability to uh, think, think in abstraction, right? Yeah. Sort of take, take a step away from um, the thing that you're looking at, um, pare it down to its essentials and, and, and present an abstract vision of that. Mm -hmm. um, that same, you know, going back to something that you were saying uh, or asking about earlier, I think that that same mindset is actually also can lead to some very different things. For example, you know, one of the things I was very interested in for many years was was writing, uh, by which I mean fiction, poetry, things like yeah. that. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, um, you know, in my days, I won't, I won't even say as a would be poet, but I'll say as an unpublished poet. Right. That, you know, um, mm -hmm. there is some of the same process that goes on. You're looking at something and poetry also makes things in some ways very abstract. You really pare down. Right. And you're just looking for these kind of essential lines that you can convey powerful and complex ideas in a very um, in a very pared down, um, but in some ways clarifying kind of way. Right. And so I think those impulses are, are very much are very much related. Um, mm. Uh, I, uh, my, 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 you know, I have, I have a friend from graduate school, Kei, Hur Kei Hirano, who is famous for his economics haikus. So I, I unfortunately oh, cannot yeah. claim that, um, uh, I use my, my poetry talents, uh, anywhere within economics. Uh, he has managed to do so for which I, I have to gr greatly admire his accomplishments. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Um, so, so you graduate and, uh, you, are you're, you're looking at, um, possible schools. I know it's not a hard decision if you're accepted into Harvard to, to go to Harvard, but what did you know about, what did you know when you were applying, you know, that, that might, were you someone who is like, I want to be, so let me, let me back up. I think a lot of there there's, I meet a lot of students, uh, they're like, I want to, um, study with this person. And then they'll like apply to go study with that person. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, and then there's, but I always kind of think, you know, you, you don't really know yet what you want, you know, like in, even, and it's not to even belittle that those important experiences that you're having in college at all. It's just that, you know, it, it's just really hard to predict what you will fall in love with in, co in yeah. grad school. And then, and that that might even itself not even persist. So I was just kind of curious, what did you think? What were you thinking before Harvard that might be your interest? So when I was applying, and you know, this this will really show me somebody who had no idea what he wanted to do. On my actual graduate school application, I was kind of pitching myself as somebody interested in macroeconomics. Mm. Um, 
And, um, but very close to what you were saying, right? I was aware, right? So, you know, a couple of years earlier, my brother had been through the same process, yeah. ended up at Columbia. Um, uh, and, you know, in his case, he was interested in sort of trade and development. And so this mm. was a very natural place for him to end up. Right. Um, but I sort of, you know, I, I learned a lot, right? So that, you know, um, he, he'd had the, we sort of essentially doubled up, but, you know, really through him, I had the benefit of some of the conversations that he'd had prior to going to different graduate schools. And mm. um, from that, you know, I really said to myself, well, okay, you know, if I get into either Harvard or MIT, I, I should go to one of those two because it's Cambridge Mass. And you sort of have the benefit of, of both right. uh, to some extent. And yeah. um, I have to say that while that is true, right? So, you know, for example, I was very lucky to have um, Josh Angrist um, as he was not one of my thesis advisors in an official sense, but in every practical sense, I was um, very lucky to have him as an advisor. Like, you know, what an amazing thing, right? I was at Harvard. I could go to MIT and I could talk to him. He was um, not at Harvard at the time because I know he started out there, but I don't know exactly right. he, he where crossed he, over. he was at MIT by that time. He goes, he goes, Harvard. Does he go Harvard, Hebrew, MIT or something exactly. like that? I exactly. see. Okay. Yeah. And so by that time he was at MIT, but you know, that's two, that's two T-stops away. And um, it was really helpful to have him around. And so in sense, in that was what I'm sort of saying here is that from that sort of T zero of graduate school application where I said, okay, yes, one, one of these has surely got to be better than anything else. Right. I think that part was borne out. Something that I, that I didn't realize and that I always talk to prospective graduate students about, and I think they're just much better informed maybe than, than I certainly was, but I, I, I might even suspect it's an entire generational shift in how well people are informed, right? That I knew the faculty members in different places, right? So I could say, okay, these are the people. I knew a little bit about their work. I could look up their work. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know a lot about the culture of different places, right? That Harvard and MIT are both amazing places, yeah. but they have very different, they have very different cultures. Mm. And there I was not very informed, right? I sort of said, okay, you know, which one, which one? I wasn't sure, um, right? And um, I, I, don't, I, I don't know if I could even give you a clear answer as to why I tipped toward Harvard rather than MIT. Well, um, so back then in the 90s, what what was the what would make a student thrive in one but not the other? Right. So, you know, I think that it's back to what I was saying about my experience at, at Harvard, which I think um, ultimately was successful, but might not have been in the sense that a little bit, as I'm sort of being honest about that, I was I was interested in many things, probably too many. Mm -hmm. I was a little bit slow to sort of pare down those interests, it took me a while to focus and really, you know, home in on what I was interested in. Mm -hmm. um, and in that context, right, I suppose in a place where I was being sort of more closely advised, or there sort of there was an advisor hovering right over me, somebody would have said at some point, okay, look, you know, it's year three. You can't just hang on to two completely unrelated sets of things. You can't say yeah. you might be a theorist, you might be doing econometrics. Um, somebody would have said that to me. Nobody said that to me, which um, I think um, I think it worked out just fine. I think in part but it of could it, or not. It might not have, right? I think I was extremely lucky in some ways. Um, and I think that in another context, um, probably at MIT, um, I, I, you know, somebody would have taken me aside much earlier and sort of said, okay, look, this is the sequence of things, right? And, you know, working backwards, you, you cannot be, you know, you need to be at another point. You can narrow this down. You cannot have two or three topics that are um, completely un unrelated. You need to really right. um, be doing something. And so um, I think for, for me, it did work out very well um, mm -hmm. for, for the reason I've just mentioned that I was somebody who did take time to sort of triangulate or maybe even wander as a more honest word from topic to topic until I really found a vein of, of, of questions that interested me and that eventually sort of became um, the, the broader set of things that I do now, right? So it kind of narrows down then broadens out. Mm -hmm. um, the, the other reason why it worked very well for me was, it, you know, Harvard was the kind of place where um, everybody is willing to talk to you, but you need to find them, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, finding them physically is not hard. They're in their office, but, you know, mm -hmm. they're, they're not going to come and seek you out. That's fair enough. Mm -hmm. but if, if you make the effort of, of going to speak with people, Mm -hmm. they're there and there's just so many people who are available and willing to talk to you right so you know um um i was a graduate student in economics um so of course you know at some point i was kind of narrowing down you know i had gary chamberlain Hito Imbens. Mm. um but you know when my cross when my topic crossed over to something else i went to talk to him about the ascent um i mm -hmm. of course get, uh, you know had also as advisors um larry katz yeah. um 
Caroline Hawksby, they're sort of, you know, because I was doing work that was kind of at this cusp between econometrics and applied stuff. And so, you know, I had them as well. Um, and so you could always talk to people and they were always willing to, to speak with you. The notion that, um, you know, they wouldn't speak to you or, or, or be constructive just didn't didn't really exist. Of yeah. course, you had to you had to take the initiative and you had to sort of be ready for that conversation, which I think is, is completely fair. Yeah. In the same spirit, um, you know, uh, another advisor in all in all but formality was was Don Rubin, right? At least for for two thirds of my dissertation, basically, right? And mm. so, in that sense, um, you know, I, I I wasn't the one that made the contact, but in some ways, Hido, as an assistant professor, was was the one who sort of followed that same kind of spirit, saying like, "Hey, we're working on this topic. We have this guy Don Rubin sitting in the stats department. Why don't I go and talk to him?" Right? And so. Yeah. In a similar spirit, when I was a graduate student, of course, I spoke to Ruben because I, you know, I, I'd taken his joint course with Hedo. But then, you know, oh, I, they taught a class together. They did. I, I'll talk. I can tell you a little bit more about that. Um, but, but you know, in the same spirit, um, just to close out that thought. But I went, I went and sought out other people. You know, I yeah. went and other statisticians. I went, you know, I, 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 by that time, I had a topic. So I knew what I was interested in. Right. So I what was the topics? Again. What were what so, were you narrowing um, down on? I, you know, I had basically two things by that point, right? So I had the work, which eventually became the propensity score work with my graduate school um, friend and co-author, Sadek Waba. Um, and then I had what eventually became, you know, what, what we call in our role, the job market paper, the sort of the the, the, the other paper in, in my dissertation was on program evaluation as a decision problem, basically using sort of Bayesian tools to think about the classic program evaluation problem. Mm. Right? And so that led me actually to lots of places because, you know, the Bayesian part, of course, there's Don Rubin, but, you know, there was, you know, Carl Morris, there's other statisticians around Harvard that were speaking, speaking to. Um, and then, of course, you know, the decision theory part is not that I was doing anything terribly sophisticated. Where did you publish that paper? That paper um, came out in Journal of Econometrics in 2005. It had, it had a kind of record for the longest delay between inception and publication until I broke that record um, uh, <laughs> recently by, by a wide margin. But um, uh, so, so that paper got accepted um, actually much earlier than that, but it was part of, I had the opportunity to put it in an in, in a volume of other papers that are going to be touching on program evaluation topics. Yeah. So I said, yeah, that sounds great. Little did I know then that, you know, there is a plus and a minus, because sometimes those volumes that have many papers, they get ah. slowed down because all the papers have to come in before you can put it out, right? Yeah, and yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. That is why it had that a late publication date of 2005. Mm -hmm. I don't remember when it was accepted, but it would have been... That's a great mm -hmm. dissertation, those three things. So that's your your JASA, your Restat, and that kind of hang together really beautifully. Um, yeah, I mean, thanks for saying so. I mean, I, I, I do think that... Um, you know, I, I do think that those ideas were in the air, right? So I mean, yeah, I I, I appreciate I appreciate the the appreciation, um, yeah. but at the same time, you know, I, I sort of think that um, a bit like other fields, you're trying to be creative, you're trying to be original, but you're also you're also part of of a current or a trend. Things are in the air, um, and you're sort of trying to pluck them from the air and and sort of put something together. And in in terms of the second paper, right, this was something that. Um, involved Gary Chamberlain as much as Hido Imbens, um, even more so because, you know, Hido himself had, was transitioning out of Harvard by that time, right? So, um, but but also um, in terms of, uh, you know, Gary Chamberlain, um, you know, one of the great econometricians, yeah. um, had sort of taken a Bayesian turn by that point. And that oh. itself, right, you know, is related to this confluence of Imbens, Imbens and Rubin. Um, <clears throat> and so by the time there's this interesting transition. So when I took Gary Chamberlain's sort of graduate econometrics course, it was not Bayesian. Uh, it's kind of classic panel data, Gary Chamberlain, like you imagine his 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 handbook, panel data article. It's kind of that that vintage of Gary Chamberlain in some ways. Yeah. And it was either the next year or two years later, I'm going to say, that he completely redid the course and it became sort of Bayesian. Mm. And so um, I remember, and this was not uncommon with Gary Chamberlain, um, people would often sit in on his course a second time because you know he was such a <clears throat> he was such a clear but also very far far thinking and terse communicator right like he just said what needed to be said and nothing more yeah <clears throat> excuse me and part of that meant that you know sometimes he would be 17 steps ahead of you right and so you're like oh okay and when you took his course the first time yes you you get you get something but um 
you would um, often sit in. I was not the only one who sit in a second time. And oh, okay, second time. Oh, around. It'd be, yeah, yeah, it, it's like a different class because he's in a. He's like a. He's he's evolving. Exactly, but even for the stuff that you, you that you think you knew. Yeah. When you hear, when you sort of already, and that's sort of, you know, ultimately, you know, a great a great compliment to Gary, which is that, you know, for the people that already know the material in some ways, right, you're kind of already basically there. His insights were so clarifying. Mm. Just make it so clear in a way that was incomparable. Mm. Well, when did you first learn about that Lalonde 1986 American Economic Review article? When, when do you remember the first time you read it? So, so um, you're asking me about um, where I first heard about the Lalonde paper. Yeah. So when did you first yeah. hear that paper? What, what, what so, was the, the context? So this goes back to 1993, mm. which was I was a second year graduate student. And <clears throat> that was the first year that um, Hito Imbens and John Rubin were teaching a joint course together. So it would have been maybe spring 1994. Mm. And so it was this, jointly taught classes are unfortunately quite rare, but when they come together, it's an amazing kind of combination, right? Because you have two different personalities, two different disciplines, and it's kind of like watching a, like two two jazz musicians, you know, riff or whatever, but they really... The different styles, and it was really, it was really cool. But anyway, one of the sort of entry points of their course was the Lalonde 1986 paper, right? Saying, you know, here was this classic paper talking about how you really, um, you know, our 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 our, our econometric methods just were not cutting it mm-hmm. for this basic problem, and that is where I first, um, I first saw this paper. Mm-hmm. So, what do you think? I mean, was it presented? You know, uh, sometimes I've heard people say, well, this was a very impactful paper um, because it casts a lot of uh, doubt and about estimation. And it, it sort of fits into this larger narrative that now is like the rise of the credibility revolution. It's kind of like part of that story. But what what was it? What did you what was the story then? Right. So the way that the story came to us then. <clears throat> and by us, I mean, really myself and Sadek Waba, um, my friend from graduate school, um, we were in that class together, was to say, okay, you know, um, you have you have Lalonde here, and, you know, his conclusion was incredibly influential, but a lot has happened since he wrote his paper, and now, what if we approached his question um, with a slightly more contemporary perspective? Would we reach the same conclusion, right? Mm-hmm. And so... That was the sort of the <clears throat> genesis of um, of approaching Robert Lalonde and actually asking if we could borrow his original data tapes from that paper. And you know, and, and when he had written it, we're talking about data tapes, right? So yeah, in fact, there, was, there right. were data tapes that came to us. Um, and it has to be said, I have you know, I only met I think Robert Lalonde two or three times in my career. Yeah. Um, but um, he was an incredible guy just based on those interactions. I know other people that know him much better. And so I know that's true. Yeah. Um, but I still um, marvel at the fact that um, as a, as, you know, as graduate students, you know, second year doctoral yeah. students, we write to him saying, hey, can we have your data? Right now, today, that's become much more common. And I think it's great that it is much more common, right? That, you know, we put our data out there to begin with. Right. Um, and if it isn't there, then people write to us. And that's a very standard question, as it should be. But in those days, it wasn't that common, right? And yeah. he said, sure. He sent over his tapes, right? Mm. Um, and so um, I think that it was- That's a big uh, deal. I mean, yeah. it's like, put if it's tape, what are tapes? What is that exactly? This is like, these are uh, not floppy disks. What are they? You know, you know, I don't know if you've seen like 1960s science fiction, like these big, <laughs> big- um, <clears throat> Like like movie camera looking things like like film. Yeah, but it was like this. It's kind of thick, thick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so he's just, he's got all that in his office. Like he's just like he's kept it. Those he's what, kept it. Yeah, and, and, so, and, and 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 you know this is the thing, right? Like it's a big part of your study. How many pre treatment years you're going to pull in? So he did you already know that before going in? You're like we want more. We did not. So that came from 
once we got into it, we sort of realized there was this issue that for some of the units, you had two years of pretreatments, for some you did not. Mm. Right. And so um, since that whole exercise was trying to think about, you know, in this application, how far can you get with the observables? Right. So mm -hmm. that's, that's the question, right? You know, in Malone's world, things have not gone so well. We said, okay, we're going to try to uh, clarify this by using, in our case, propensity score methods. Yeah. Um, and that's but, what, and, and from that class with Ruben, it was like, I mean, is, is it, could you have gone other routes? Like, I mean, you know, matching and all these things. I, I never quite know what the, what the entire, you know, horizon would have been. You do propensity scores, you do the stratification and all these options, but was there like on the table, you know, you could do all these things. I mean, you got this whole class that you're doing with Ruben. You could have done that's all a good, that's, a, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, I suppose we could have gone the Bayes route as well, because mm. there's, a lot, there's a lot of Bayes that we were doing in that class as well. Mm. But um, we did not, because in some sense, you know, it really seemed as though it's what I sort of tell my students is the missing table in the Lalonde paper. Oh, that's interesting. By which, by which I'm not implicating Lalonde himself. It, it's missing from his paper because almost every paper of that generation or before a certain point in time looked like that, right? That, you know, in today's paper, we all, it's, we're, it's so universal that we're used to seeing it, right? You look for table one or table two, it's going to be descriptive statistics yeah. of the whole sample broken down by treatment and control group. Yes. Right? That, but you see, that mentality that we have, that notion that, okay, this is how we're thinking about it, and it's kind of obvious that you must compare these. It doesn't matter. It can even be an experiment. We're doing it there because we want to know that things are well balanced. Yeah. If it's not an experiment, even more so, right? We need mm. that table to just begin our thought on what we should do. Mm. And so um, in many ways, I sort of think that, you know, in, in sort of thinking about that, that, <clears throat> that paper, that work, I always, that's one of the things I point out, right? That, you know, in some ways, this is maybe even the most, fundamental contribution, not of us, but of that sort of intellectual movement, right? That, you mm. know, bringing this kind of Ruben causal model approach into economics has, has clarified this one. You need that table. You can't- You, you need the table because yeah. the your your target parameter is, uh, you know, uh, Y1 minus Y0, and you're going to be essentially imputing or, you know, fill, uh, imputing a counterfactual from another group that's not- that unit that is in the target parameter, which is counterfactual. So you you need to start looking at how these guys are different from each other. Is that what you're saying? Exactly. That's exactly oh, that's interesting. Yeah, because I mean, if you don't if you don't think that way, yeah, that's really interesting. If you don't think in terms of that, here's the two groups, and we're going to be using one group as a counterfactual for the other, which it clearly isn't the counterfactual. Yep. Then, you know, you're just, you don't have to, I guess you don't have to make that table too. Exactly. Exactly. Right. And, and, and so that back to your question made it a very natural step to say, okay, if, okay, look, oh, these observables are really different. Mm -hmm. That is sort of a call for saying, okay, observables looking really different, maybe propensity score mm -hmm. in one of its flavors can be the thing that, that, that tidies the situation up. Yeah. Right. So um, in, in some ways, I would say that, you know, that is, that is what, that is, that, that is the sort of the second piece of it, which is to say that, yeah, once we knew that observables were important, then the question is, okay, do we have the observables that matter, right? This assumption, conditional independence, it only makes sense when you believe for whatever reason that you have the covariance of matter. Yeah. And we were very, right. And we, we were very keen to sort of explore that assumption. So sometimes our on paper, papers are sort of viewed or were interpreted ex post as sort of cheerleading for propensity score, right? And yeah. that's not in some ways an unfair interpretation because we were saying, look, you use this method, it actually it actually can work, right? But we were also saying that you use this method, it can work, but only if the assumption is valid. And right. here is a case where you can just point to it saying, okay, if you don't have two years of data in our paper, we said, look, let's strip away one year of data suddenly doesn't work as well, right? Mm. And so there you have within the, within the actual application, the example of, yes, it can work if the assumption is valid in, in, in the context or application that you have, but if it isn't, mm. then, you know, it, it's not going to work. And so mm. I think that sometimes that 
cautionary second note that we did hit um, was sort of lost over the years. And, you know, that's fine. You know, if you're if your paper is remembered, ultimately you don't care too much you know, whether people get all, all, all the messages you're trying to tell. Yeah. But I do think that, you know, whether from us or from sort of the literature just in general, I think we've reached a somewhat more balanced point on this, right? That, you know, yeah. we sort of understand that, yes, there are situations in which uh, a propensity score or matching or reweighting these are really useful tools to have in at your disposal. This is part of your arsenal. Right. You're going to use it. Sometimes it may be, um, it may be in complement to other things. Mm -hmm. Occasionally, it may be the identification approach you're using. Yeah. Um, but um, sometimes it may be diagnostic, right? And yeah. I sometimes think of what we were doing. The initial steps really shows that this is a really good diagnostic tool as well, right? Yeah. How how different do these observables look? Yeah. Um, but then there may also be times when you say, no, look, you know, it's just not the data is not the data are not there right. to, to 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 sustain this approach. And then right. you should say so. So I always remember um, Ruben giving some examples. I've forgotten what it was. It's one of the projects he'd worked on at some point where he sort of made this point that, you know, by looking at the data and asking, you know, basically he's talking about common support, what we, what we now call common support. Right. That, yeah. When in looking at the data, he said, look, there just isn't common support. So, you know, we can't answer this, but I'm not even going to try, right? And as researchers, we have that luxury and I yeah. think we should use it, right? And right. so um, in my world, um, I, I teach doctoral students, but I also teach public policy students, right? So people yeah. who are going to go into a world where maybe they're not given that choice, right? Yeah. You must yeah. come back with the best answer you have. Um, and you don't have the luxury of saying, well, I, I don't, I don't, I can't do that, right? And so that's that's a slight difference between sort of the world of research um and the world of of sort of applied applied policy work where you may not have that luxury. But it's important to remember. And even if um you're you're not given that luxury, like you know, I want to know the best answer you can give me, at least in your mind, somewhere you can sort of make it clear, like these are the qualifications or caveats to that. So right. um, I think it was, I think it was um an amazing um, moment to be a graduate student at Harvard. Now, maybe everybody that maybe that's nostalgia. Like everybody says that about yeah, when they were yeah. a graduate student, right? And that's fair enough. But in the specific sense that it was a moment where, um, actually, there were, there are a lot of cro crossovers happening when I was when I was a graduate student, right? So I talked about the fact that you know I worked with Ruben, Ruben and 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 Hido were already working together um, in that class that 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 we sat in that, that we took in in from their their first joint class. Um, there were both, both econ and statistics graduate students, right? It was kind of going both ways. Yeah. Um, and, um, <clears throat> you know, in my sort of, in my other field that I never pursued, um, you know, I was theory, right? I was, I was, I was for a couple of years kind of sitting in on everything, right? And so that was a period in which, um, you know, Leibson had just arrived at Harvard. Mm. Behavioral economics was beginning. There's kind of a behavioral economics reading group that I was a part of. Mm. Um, in which we were sort of studying, you know, psychology and economics, and uh, Sandel Molinov had arrived as a graduate student, so he was in that group as well, right? And so there were all these things that were happening in, on that side as well, right? And so mm -hmm. um, it was, it was, it. I think it was a very fruitful moment, and I think that in economics we have gotten really good at um, being able to borrow good ideas from other fields, right? right. And I, I, I think that in the case of my work. Um, and that sort of movement, it clearly was this sort of, um, um, marriage of, of sort of economics and statistics that I think could, gave something back to both fields, right? I yeah, think yeah. statistics, I think they've gotten something out of it as well. And mm -hmm. of course, we're economists, so we're going to take those ideas and push them in our own direction, right? We're not just going to become statisticians and that's fine. That's as it should be, but if we can walk away with a couple of good ideas, Mm -hmm. um, and if you look at economics, clearly there's some ideas that just completely change the way you think about things. Mm -hmm. um, then you know that's that's an amazing uh, outcome from um, a set of conversations that that began um, you know uh, in in Hedo's telling, like at the at at the, at the washing machines between you know uh, between Angus and Imbens when they were. Yeah. I think Angus was still visiting. I think maybe before I arrived, he was like a visiting professor at Harvard, mm -hmm. right? And so like you know conversations over the washing machine between these two guys eventually led them to pull in Ruben. And, you know, I, I, I say 
um, in, in, in all sort of accuracy, right? That, you know, changed the direction of my life as well. And yeah. I think that, that's, that's always true. Oh, life yeah, can always, right. be to- always be told as, um, as, as kind of a logical plan or as a series of accidents. Um, and I'm personally very comfortable seeing it in the latter way that, you know, things happen um, and, and, and you sort of hopefully are lucky enough or, 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 or opportunist enough or smart enough to kind of, yes. Okay. Let's, let's, it's here. Let's just take it and run with it. Yeah. 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 You know, it's funny the, there's so many subtle, subtle things in those two papers that you wrote that I don't know if people fully absorb, you know, one is, um, just the, the diagnostic value of the propensity score to evaluate common support, how much different would Lalone's paper have been if he had, uh, that one, just that one piece, just that one piece. Exactly. I think it would have been, um, completely different, completely different. Uh, Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, um, that diagnostic piece, just being able to say, okay, let's, here's a histogram. And it just jumps out at you like, oh, 15,992 CPS comparison units. Mm-hmm. But only like, you know, 15,000 or more of them are just not relevant, right? Like, exactly, you know, right. And, you know, name a linear regression um, that existed in 1986 um, or even in 1994 when we were working on this, 95, yeah. that, that can solve that problem. Right? Exactly, um, right. And yeah, so- I think, like a lot of people, I think they see with propensity scores, they're like, I mean, th- there's a group of people that sort of see propensity scores as as uh, non-causal. You know, they'll just like flat out say it. And, you know, it's like it's a long conversation. You know, there's there's like, you know, a, a bumper sticker kind of statement that I that I think you just have to have to pull that out. But the thing is, like what I think people don't really realize is, you know, first of all, just even being able to explore K dimensions of covariates is really, really hard to, to exactly. like explore that. Like just mm-hmm. even like you can't even visualize it. You don't even like, it's not easy to do to try to think about common support concepts when you have, you know, 10 variables and just huge number of straight up per variable. It's just like, just not, it's not possible. Then you get it into this propensity score and then you just do this, histogram and you're like well good lord like 10,000 of these observations in the cps have a propensity score point that of essentially zero exactly you know like they just like they're like not anything like the people in this experiment they're not even remotely like it's they're not relevant and but but then the other thing so that alone i just kind of feel like you know when people are wanting to go like why don't I just run regressions? You know, it's like, you just kind of want to go, okay, fine. There's a whole conversation, but I don't even think you really fully appreciate who is in your control group. You, you don't, you don't really quite, well, one, you don't even have the table two that we were describing. And I mean, in a way it's kind of like, this is even a part of that conversation you had a minute ago, which is like the missing table, mm-hmm. uh, you know, how these groups are really different from each other, you know? And just yeah. putting in controls is like, uh, yeah. Anyway, that was just yeah. No, and, and you know that, that I again, you know, I I I I I am not a deep student of the history of ideas. So I, but I can say that in my life and maybe in our times, we can credit some of this to the to the statistics part of of the marriage of economics and statistics. Right. This is very much a stats tradition. Right. Like, all right, before we start modeling this data. Yeah. Let's look at the data. Let's find a way to look right. at it. And, right, right, right. Um, uh, and I've learned, um, I've learned a lot. I wish I could have learned more, but I've learned a lot from statistics in in that in that in that vein. Right, you've got to mm. look at the data before you decide how you're going to tackle it. Whereas, you know, as, as economists, we we do still think in sort of identification terms, right? All right, yeah, so right. This isn't the identifying assumption that implies this estimator. So let's go, right? And right, right. right. I, I understand the importance of that way of thinking about it as well. Yeah. Um, but I think in good applied work there is some room for both of those, right? That yes, yeah. even if I have a fundamental identification strategy right. that I believe is credible, yeah. um, I think it's not going to be a waste of my time to look at my data before I pull the trigger on, yeah. on, on what it is that I'm going to do. I know. Um, 
in, in, in terms of whether it, it is causal or not, I, I think it really always has to come back to the situation you're looking at and what assumptions are believable. Mm-hmm. Right? So, you know, there are some situations in which um, people are assigned into a treatment or exposed to a policy um, based on on covariates, right? Like, you know, yep. somebody had to decide, they were given, and like, you know, I, I'm sitting in an office, I've got a stack of 15,000 files in front of me, and I've got to sort them out left and right, and just based on what's in the file. So, you know, there are there there are there are more than a few situations like that, but there yeah. are more than a few situations that are not like that. Right? Yeah, and right. I think this is perfectly fine, right? So, yeah. Uh, yeah. A stu- you know, a, 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 a confession I always make to my students when I'm talking about regression discontinuity is I remember seeing uh, Wilbert Plunder Clough present the first RD paper when I was a graduate student. Yeah. Um, I've gotten the year, but it must have been right around then too, right? Like maybe '95. I, it's got to it's got to be around. Yeah. That. Right. 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 And so. I remember thinking, okay, this is really nice, but this isn't going to be, this isn't really very applicable, is it? Right? Like, you know, how often are you going to have the situation where, <laughs> you know, it's just set up exactly in this way that you have this discontinuity? Of course, I was, I was wrong. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, well, <laughs> exactly. Really wrong. Famous um, last words. Famous last words. But, you know, I, I would say that, you know, you, 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 there are likewise, you know, there, there are some situations in which, yes, you might, you might. Yeah, that's a really good point. Yep. You know, yeah, this could be possible because this is the way that people were assigned. And we really believe that only these covariates uh, determine which way yep. you went in that well, assignment. But that, that, that's a really good point. I mean, I, I think like that's where, for me, propensity scores and selection on observables of all the methods really. It's the one that reminds me how important it is that we're experts in the area that we're studying. You know, it's like you, you've got to yeah. be, you know, it's like you you can sort of like take like natural experiment approaches and diff and diffs and stuff. And like you can just kind of be almost kind of like, here's an event. I'm going to do this thing. But but in some ways it's like, OK, well, this might the propensity scores might be appropriate, might not be. It really does depend on, you know, do I really have a good understanding about why these units got into the treatment? That, of course, is always true. But it's like, you know it's like in your face a little bit with, with selection on observables. Yeah, you know? exactly. exactly. And, um, you know, even that, that way of thinking about, it, right. That, you know, what determines assignment of treatment, it all goes back to that same potential outcome world. And when you start thinking about these things in that yeah. way, it just jumps out at you. It was all, yeah. I'm not saying that they invent, you know, I'm not saying that that's where it was invented. Yeah. But when you think about it that way, it just becomes so transparent. Right? It, it's, it yeah. 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 Well, so, uh, let me, let me conclude here. Um, so, you know, I, we didn't get to really talk about professor Embens very much, but I mean, uh, what, what would you say was sort of the, 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 the rewarding part of just getting to, you know, learn from him at that time of your career? It was an incredible opportunity. So, you know, I think that, um, first and foremost, there, there are a lot of things to say, but, you know, first and foremost, and I, I only appreciated this in some ways exposed because this, you know this is these are the people who I knew. But the fact that um, somebody who's a really high value econometrician yeah. was interested in speaking with someone like me who you know was not necessarily heading down that path, right? So mm-hmm. let's just start there, right? So he became um, you know one of my one of my principal advisors. That reflects something about him and his interests um, and and his approach. And of course. Now that I have a bigger picture of what he's done, right? Sometimes as a graduate student, you also see your advisors in, in, from a particular angle, usually looking up at them, right? And so you're going to just see them in a certain way. If you sort of see the totality of what Hito has done, that spirit has also motivated his own work, right? That you know he's somebody who's been who's done econometrics, but has pursued questions that are important to people in the world, not just to prove a theorem because you can prove it, but because right. this is an important question. Yeah, and, and hence, so you know, if I look back on it, I guess it makes sense that. He was willing to work with me, um, mm-hmm. but it was a great fortune for me um, that he was. I think Hito was also, um, and Gary as well, but in very different ways. They were incredibly um, available and hands-on advisors, right? That, you know, um, they both had different ways of working, yeah. but um, I sort of used them both as sort of um, role models when I'm dealing with my own graduate students, right? That, you know, we all get busy and they must have been really busy as well, right? Um, but they did find the time to give very careful and thoughtful advice and really sort of push in key directions at the right moment. Yeah. Um, and so I think that was a great fortune. And, you know, last but not least, I would say, and I think this is, of course, to some extent true of of, of advisors, but not, not, not all of them, right? I think that, um, you know, also when you're done, 
you sort of realize that you are um, sort of part of an intellectual family, mm -hmm. right? And I think that that shows when, you know, um, uh, mm. unfortunately, Gary Chamberlain died fairly recently, right? It's a number of his former students had a chance uh, to come together, celebrate him in different ways. Um, and yes, we all did very different things, but you do sort of see that, we were using this phrase earlier, intellectual lineage, right? That, you know, you do sort of see that connection. And likewise, um, Fido, um, you know, you also see that, you also see that, um, you also see that as well. And so um, I, I I do think from from the very beginning, you know, from even before I, I joined graduate school and I was in college or in high school um, to, to, to the present day, uh, I do feel very fortunate for the luck um, um, to have run into a set of individuals um, that were um, incredible advisors in different ways um, to have been in environments that um, were ripe with ideas yeah. um, and to be able to run with them. I guess that took um, a, a little bit of, of skill and hard work as well, but um, uh, it also it also took just just the luck of being there. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Well, it's been a real pleasure uh, to get to talk in person, and I really really have, have loved learning more about your career and and about this. Uh, uh, the, this work that you, you did in graduate school. I know we didn't really leave graduate school, but, um, it's, uh, it's, it's been really nice to, to learn more of the stories behind, uh, th that time in your life. Thank you, Scott. It's been really, it's been really a fun conversation. It's always nice to have the chance, um, to sort of reminisce about these things, but to reminisce, uh, about them with someone, uh, who is, is deeply knowledgeable about the area is very much interested in it. Um, and sort of, you know, for whom, like for me, you know, the, the, these 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 sort of events are, um, you know, events in our own intellectual history and in, in our little world. Yeah. Um, like these are really cool things and cool moments. And it's really a pleasure to get a chance to talk with somebody who clearly has the same sort of pleasure and appreciation for these for these moments in, in, in our intellectual progress. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I love it. I love your work, too. And those two papers I'll be uh, that, that you that you wrote uh, with Dr. Waba, I will be reading them and assigning them for a long time. So it's really neat to talk. Thank you so much, Scott. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.